Hello and welcome to chapter 6 of the OpenStack Psychology textbook. My name is Matthew Poole and I'm an instructor of psychology at Northeast State Community College and today we're learning about learning. So let's get into it. So whenever it comes to uh, us as humans, we have what's known as instincts as well as reflexes. I know that we all know that, but I want to dive into it a little bit more because we have to have this foundation before we understand the different forms of learning that psychology has founded, such as operant conditioning as well as classical conditioning. So it's important that we get these baseline phrases uh, out of the way. So as we all know, we're born with particular reflexes. These are motor neural reactions to a specific stimulus. So we don't have to do any training or any learning for these reflexes to occur. They're simpler than instincts. They only require particular areas of the body and involve uh, primitive centers of the central nervous system. This is why human babies are born with a sucking reflex as well as a rooting reflex. Whenever you put your hand on their your hand on their cheek, they tend to move toward that. It's because they have these innate reflexes that you don't have to train them. They are survival mechanisms. But what we're going to learn about today is how we can train those reflexes and allow them to associate with other stimuli as well as utilizing uh, reinforcement as well as punishment with operant conditioning, but more on that down the road. We at least know what reflexes are. And instincts are behaviors triggered by a broader range of events. So this can include aging, changes of seasons, things like that. We all know um, that whenever it comes to instincts, it involves a movement of the organism as a whole. Okay, reflexes are, you know, involve, you know, particular areas and specific areas of the body okay moving forward so what is learning okay so learning to give a definition to is a relatively permanent change in behavior that results from experience okay and so we as humans are excellent association machines. I've talked about in previous chapters how we're not as great memory machines, but whenever we apply things to uh, associate to the material that we're studying, it's a lot easier to remember it because we're association machines. That's why whenever we have uh, these acronyms like PEMDAS, of all the things that you probably remember from high school mathematics, it's probably PEMDAS, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, add, and subtract. And the the reason that we remember that a lot easier is because we're applying an associative method to those particular phrases, okay? But classical conditioning goes a little bit further into just associative learning, okay? It is associative learning, but it helps us to anticipate events. So we all know or have at least heard of the Pavlov's dogs experiment, right? Where Pavlov trained his dogs to salivate to the ringing of a ticking metronome, but we always say bell. They salivate to the sound of a bell. And naturally, a bell does not cause salivation in humans nor animals, but it's because of understanding this concept of associative learning and specifically classical conditioning, which adds on to that to help us to anticipate events, we can now train our reflexes to associate with um, stimuli that's totally neutral or unrelated, and then it will become a conditioned stimulus, uh, which elicits a conditioned response or reflex. Okay, so I know I said a, that was a whole lot of verbiage to like take in in one setting, but let's dive a little bit more into this. So as we know, we all have unconditioned stimuli. Uh, a stimulus, as you all remember, is any person, place, or thing that elicits a response in a human or an animal. So naturally, food is an unconditioned stimulus for us. You don't have to do any training for us to salivate or want to desire that particular food. Um, or that particular stimulus, which is food. Now, that unconditioned response is a response that needs no training whatsoever, as I've already mentioned. So naturally, food equals salivation whenever we're super hungry. All right. Now, when it comes to the actual conditioning part, what happens is we're pairing something that's completely neutral with an unconditioned stimulus. Uh, it, you typically right before or as you are giving the uh, unconditioned stimulus. So in this case, what Pavlov did was he rang the bell, 
prior to giving the food. So obviously, just by itself, the neutral stimulus is not going to elicit any sort of response, especially the unconditioned response of salivation. Okay. Now, moving forward pretty quickly, and dogs are really good at understanding and picking up on conditioning uh, you know, materials, pretty soon that neutral stimulus is going to become a conditioned stimulus, which will equal that conditioned reflex or response aka salivation. So eventually bell will equal salivation. All right, And that's just another illustration that you can go through on your own time whenever you are studying. Okay, so whenever it comes to classical conditioning specifically, it doesn't just stop at one uh, neutral stimulus or now condition stimulus, it can go even further than that. So let's take for example figure 6-5. So similar situation where a cat understands that whenever they hear the can opener, food is about to arrive. So naturally, if there was no conditioning whatsoever, the electric can opener would not cause a salivatory response or cause the cat to come running to it. All right, but after enough time, it became that condition stimulus where they understand can opener equals food about to happen. Now, whenever it comes to higher order conditioning, we're adding on to that already conditioned stimulus. Uh, into a second order stimulus. So if you keep an electric can opener in a squeaky cabinet door, whenever you pair that enough times, you keep that electric can opener in there and open it enough times, the cat's not just going to understand that the electric can opener equals food's about to arrive, but also the squeaky cabinet door is what holds that electric can opener. So we now have a second order stimulus of a squeaky cabinet door. So some of y'all, you recognize your cats may uh, come running to you whenever you even... Uh, just open up a, a cabinet. It's because they uh, have been conditioned. All right, moving forward. So that whole period that I was just describing, whenever we're training uh, an individual to um, have that conditioned stimulus, we're training a neutral stimulus and pairing it with an unconditioned stimulus, that's what's known as the acquisition phase, the initial period of learning when an organism learns to connect a neutral stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus. So um, whenever an individual does have a condition stimulus such as the bell um, over time let's say that we rang that bell but we didn't give the dog the food well whenever and after enough times and after plenty of times the the dog will understand that the bell has no association with the food now that's what's known as extinction the decrease in the condition response when the UCS is no longer present with the CS, so no whenever the uh, unconditioned stimulus is no longer present with this with the condition stimulus, condition stimulus being bell, unconditioned stimulus being food. Now, let's say after a, a period of time, we one day ring the bell, and then the dog comes running and they're salivating. Okay, wait, what happened? I thought we extinguished the uh, what was once con condition stimulus, now neutral stimulus, I thought we uh, made that extinct. Well, there is a, an occurrence called a spontaneous recovery where there's a brief return of a previously extin extinguished condition response following a rest period. So you may have it eventually, like a dog may have a spontaneous recovery where you do bring it one day and they just kind of like, oh wait, maybe there's food and then they just go back to, to normal. It's usually very brief and really quick. After that, they continue back on being extinct from the once conditioned stimulus. All right, moving forward. Stimulus disc uh, discrimination versus stimulus generalization. So as we've probably, we may talk about this, yeah, we'll go ahead and talk about uh, John B. Watson. So one of the things that John B. Watson was famous for was the Little Albert experiment. Uh, Watson trained a little baby, effectively, to be fearful of white fluffy thing, or just fluffy things in general. And so the way that he did this was he made the baby learn from association, okay? The d main difference between classical conditioning and operant conditioning is that classical conditioning is involuntary. You really don't have a say-so in the response that's elicited. And so whenever the baby um, was being shown like a bunny rabbit, uh, a Santa Claus mask, whenever they were being shown that, what Watson did was he was slamming on, like a bar together and uh, making a super loud noise. And he was acting on the unconditioned stimulus of a loud noise, which 
for humans, we are naturally fearful of loud noises. So whenever you do that into a baby's ear, they're going to start crying and wailing and be super uncomfortable and fearful. And so what he did was he was associating those, that super loud noise and that fear with, uh, you know, fluffy things such as the bunny, the um, uh, Santa Claus mask, among other things. And so what, it, you know, Watson came to find out is that um, little Albert was not able to discriminate between stimuli. Whenever he was shown things that were similar to the things that he was being conditioned to, he actually generalized. So generalization is when an organism demonstrates the condition response to stimuli that are similar to the condition stimulus. So they will still react the same way, even if it somewhat mimics what they were being trained to associate that, um, that unconditioned stimulus with. Okay, so habituation is learning not to respond to a stimulus that is pre uh, repeatedly present without change. So as a stimulus is repeated, we learn to not focus our attention on it. So kind of similar to sensory adaptation, but it's different in the sense that um, whenever it comes to habituation, we're referring to whenever you have a... Um, a stimulus that elicits a response. So whenever we have something happen to us that should elicit a response to us, we can habituate from it and learn to uh, not respond to it rather than just having a, an overall sensory adaptation to something. Okay, moving forward. So the other thing too with Watson is that, you know, he is considered the father of behaviorism. He truly thought that you could take a baby and they are com a complete blank slate and depending on the environmental influences you present with them, you can literally turn them into whatever you want them to be. So I guess a doctor, a lawyer, a good citizen, a bad citizen, a criminal, a serial killer, you name it. But under the right conditions, Watson thought that behavior was basically entirely due to environmental factors, which people would argue with in that they would say that, hey, there's at least some genetic component to how individuals behave. But Watson didn't see it as such. Okay, let's talk about operant conditioning. So as mentioned, operant conditioning is relatively voluntary comparatively to classical conditioning. Operant conditioning is learning from our consequences. So we have what's introduced to us known as rewards as well as punishment. And so whenever you break it down, it, this can get kind of confusing to people because they'll say positive and think it inherently means good. They'll see negative. They think it inherently means bad. But that's not the case. Positive just means something's being added to the situation, and negative means something is being taken away from the situation. And we'll talk about that more in the coming slides and make sure you're as squared away as we can in the time frame given. Now, operant conditioning is based on the law of effect, which states that we have have the tendency to engage in behaviors that elicit a positive um, or enjoyable consequence and less likely to engage in behaviors that elicit an unpleasant or neutral consequence. Okay. So whenever it comes to B.F. Skinner, one of the things that he did was he created what's known as the Skinner box. And the Skinner box simply displayed that um, whenever you put a rat in a chamber and you have a particular lever, whenever they pull the lever, their dispense is a reward. So obviously they are engaging in a behavior that's eliciting a pleasant consequence. So he adds on to this, referring to this, of course, as negative, re or as, excuse me, as positive reinforcement, but it goes a little bit more into just positive reinforcement. So again, I don't want you to get too lost in the weeds with it whenever it comes to um, to this particular section because I'm going to make this as simple as possible for my class and um, make sure it's not as – I know it can be confusing on the initial end, but once you go through it a few times, you, you tend to get a decent grasp on it. So again, when it comes to reinforcement, we are simply trying to – make the behavior more likely to occur, okay? Positive means that we're adding something to the situation to, again, reinforcement, make a behavior more likely to occur. When it comes to negative reinforcement, write this down. Negative reinforcement is whenever we, again, negative equals remove, 
removing something from the situation, reinforcement to make a behavior more likely to occur. Okay, so usually whenever it comes to a negative reinforcement, it's the removal of an already present adverse stimulus or unpleasant stimulus to make a behavior more likely to occur. This is something to write down here. When you're navigating situational questions on a test, which we'll go through some here in a second, we go by the ABC model, okay? You can go ahead and mark out the A for most things, but the A stands for antecedent. This is what happens prior to the behavior, okay? Then the B, this stands for what is the target behavior. Now, whenever you're asking yourself, what is the target behavior, then ask yourself, are we trying to increase or decrease the likelihood of a behavior. This will tell us whether or not this situational question is reinforcement or punishment, okay? So do not try to identify whether something's positive or negative until you've identified if something's reinforcement or punishment because lastly is the consequence. And that's where we're gonna identify if something's being added to the situation after the behavior or if something's being removed from the situation and I'm gonna make this make a little bit more sense and show you how both positive and negative reinforcement can co-occur in the same situation so this is my dog Bella she is an old English Bulldog at the time of recording this she's about two years old and something that she's done to her family is she has negatively reinforced us what do I mean by that well Bella whenever she wants pets she will begin barking Okay, and then she's trained her parents that whenever they hear the barking, they will automatically uh, pet her. So this is something that we're trying to break. We don't consider this the most adequate behavior. Um, but this is considered negative reinforcement. How do I come to that conclusion? Again, we write down the ABC model. What is, we'll just go ahead and go to the behavior for now. So from Bella's perspective, and this is why perspective is important whenever you're going through uh, operant conditioning. From Bella's perspective, her target behavior towards us is pets, right? She wants us to pet her. Now is Bella trying to increase or decrease this behavior? She's trying to increase that. So that tells me right off the bat that this is reinforcement for her. She's wanting to reinforce us in some way. Okay, What's happening before the behavior in the ABC model? Well, she's already barking, right? That's what's happening before the behavior. So the antecedent is the barking. So now we've identified the behavior, which is pets. What happens after we engage in the target behavior? We actually pet her. Bella stops barking. The removal of an already present adverse stimulus or unpleasant stimulus to make a behavior more likely to occur. So because Bella is in the consequence section removing something from the situation, that means we put it together and anything that we're removing is negative. So negative reinforcement, right? Now, from my perspective to Bella, guess what? I am positively reinforcing her. Well, how do I come to that conclusion? I thought it can just be one. Nope. It can be both simultaneous. It can be either or simultaneously. Okay. So write our ABC model down. When it comes to B, my target behavior toward Bella, apparently I'm telling her, and this can be an unconscious or unknown thing that I'm doing, um, which I obviously know it, but I'm saying for, you know, typical pet owners, Behavior, the behavior that I'm telling her is my target behavior is her barking, right? So we're writing barking down under the behavior. Now, am I apparently trying to increase or decrease that? Apparently, I'm trying to increase it because I'm trying to tell her that when she wants pets, of course, I don't want her to, but my actions show that I want her to increase her barking whenever she wants pets. So that makes it reinforcement, okay? Now, after uh, Bella engages in the barking, what is the consequence for Bella? She gets pets. So am I adding pets or removing pets from the situation? That's the consequence. I'm adding pets, obviously, right? And so because I'm adding pets whenever she barks, that means it's positive. 
And unknowingly, I'm telling her that I want her to continue to bark in the future whenever she wants pets. So that is reinforcement, positive reinforcement. All right. Now, when it comes to positive punishment and negative punishment, same situation, just a little bit backwards. So positive punishment is you're adding something to the situation to make a behavior less likely to occur. Negative punishment, removing something to make a behavior less likely to occur. So when positive punishment comes into play, you're typically adding an unpleasant stimulus to, or yeah, an unpleasant stimulus to make something less likely to occur. Negative punishment, you're removing something that is pleasant uh, to make a behavior less likely to occur. So let's run through a few examples. So when a child cleans their room, you give them extra time to play their video games, okay? So let's write our, our ABC model. What is the target behavior from the parents into the child? Because this is, it's saying you give them extra time. So you are the person who it's, the perspective is. So from you to the child, you are trying to, the target behavior is cleaning the room, right? So we write that under the B section. Are we trying to increase cleaning the room or decrease it? Obviously increase. So that tells me automatically that it's reinforcement. Okay, we go to our C section, the consequence. So what happens after the behavior? This is where we identify positive versus negative. So when they engage in the target behavior, you give them extra time to play their video games. So you're adding something to the situation, which means it's positive. So put it together, positive reinforcement. When you begin driving without a seatbelt, your car begins to beep. You then buckle up to remove the beeping. Therefore, you're more likely to buckle up to avoid the beeping in the future. Write out your ABC model. Okay. When it comes to the behavior, you've got to look at it from the car manufacturer or the car's perspective because it's, it's what's happening to you. You are the one being trained, right? So the target behavior is buckling up. Are they wanting to increase or decrease it? They want you to increase your seatbelt buckling. So we automatically know that that is going to be reinforcement. So what happens in the C section after behavior, after the, after the C section, I need to quit saying that, in the consequence section is something is being removed. When you buckle up, when you engage in the target behavior, the beeping is removed. So because something's being removed for the, from the situation, that means that it's negative reinforcement. All right. Mom and dad want to reduce the number of times their child misbehaves in public. Whenever Josh misbehaves, they administer a spanking when they get home. Okay, so mom and dad's perspective to Josh. All right, the target behavior is misbehaving. It's already telling you in this example here they're wanting to reduce it. So it doesn't really uh, cause us too much friction of the mind here to figure this one out. So ABC model behavior is misbehaving. They're wanting to reduce that. Okay, so that means, or decrease the likelihood of it, so that tells me that it is automatically punishment. So after Josh does engage, though, in misbehaving, what happens when he engages in the target behavior? He is given a spanking when uh, the, you know, his family gets home. So something's being added to the situation after the behavior, the consequence. So that means that it is positive punishment. Mom and dad want Cindy to stop fighting with her brother, so each time she gets in an argument, they take away her favorite toy. Okay, So from mom and dad's perspective to Cindy, ABC model, start with the behavior. Behavior is the fighting. She wants her to, they want her to stop fighting with her brother, so they're wanting to reduce that behavior. So that tells me that it's punishment right out the gate. After she does actually engage in the target behavior of fighting with her brother, um, they take away something. They take away her favorite toy. So it's a removal of something, again, to make her behavior less likely to occur. So this is negative punishment. Okay? So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. I want you to try, if you're watching this video, for especially for a class, I want you to try and navigate these four on your own. I'm going to pause for just a moment so you can... Uh, work on this and uh, I'll give a delay so I'm not giving the answers right away uh, but whenever you return you will hear me say what each bullet point is I'm not gonna go over every single one of them obviously I'm just going to give the answer for each so you can test how well you did okay 
So when it comes to the bullet one, that's going to be positive reinforcement. Bullet two is negative reinforcement. Bullet three is positive punishment. Bullet four is negative punishment. How'd you do? Okay. Primary and secondary reinforcements. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it's something that may be on a test. Whenever it comes to a primary reinforcer, this is something that we get to enjoy immediately, such as food, water, uh, sleep, all, all uh, uh, anything that causes an immediate enjoyment is going to be considered a primary reinforcer. Now, however, most of us try to achieve on a daily basis a secondary reinforcer. We try to go to work and uh, earn a living and get the uh, earn a paycheck and get those tokens, right? We try and uh, get those secondary reinforcers, which is something that we can later cash in for a primary reinforcer. So secondary reinforcers are just as, as reinforcing, but they don't have an, any inherent value to them. Obviously, uh, the numbers on a screen when I look at my bank account doesn't do anything for me and my... Um, and cash is maybe at best used for like, um, you know, getting something up, up off the ground if you need to, like a piece of gum or whatever. And my debit card is only good for uh, an ice scraper and a pinch, right? So there's no inherent value to them, but you can cash those in for something that is enjoyable. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the difference between a continuous reinforcer versus a partial reinforcer, uh, or reinforcement, I should say. So continuous reinforcement is whenever you get a reinforcer every single time. And yes, this can be pretty, um, pretty uh, consistent uh, and, and will keep you involved in what it is that you're trying to be reinforced to do but partial reinforcement is something that doesn't happen every single time and so this is why it can be even more reinforcing than a continuous reinforcer because it's exciting it's like kind of like gambling you never know when you're going to hit and receive the compensation or the reward or whatever the case is uh, for engaging in a particular behavior Okay, so we have fixed versus ratio, excuse me, fixed versus variable, interval versus ratio. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. There's only one that I want to particularly focus on in the next slide. But just to give a little bit of uh, a distinction, we can have a fixed interval schedule, a fixed ratio, a variable interval, as well as a variable ratio schedule. So whenever it comes to fixed, that means it's it happens every single time. So fixed interval, it's ba it's um, it, after the amount of time you'll get, like every 10 minutes, you'll get the reinforcer. Whereas uh, fixed ratio, after every fifth um, uh, pull of the lever is whenever you'll get reinforced. Variable interval means that um, it varies on when you're going to receive something. So you may be waiting for seven minutes to get the reward, then you'll be waiting another 30 minutes, uh, and things like that. Now when it comes to variable ratio, this is whenever uh, it varies in the amount of responses. So after every seventh, and then, or after the seventh turn, and then after the 15th, after the 30th, so on and so forth. It's completely, you never really know when you're going to hit. And that's why variable ratio is the highest reinforcing schedule because that's what's associated with gambling. So if you'll join me over here uh, with variable ratio, after it, you never know after the amount of times you pull that lever when that it's going to happen. And the reason why it's uh, so reinforcing is because it's exciting. If there's anything that dopamine, the neurotransmitter that's involved in reward, craving, and learning, and addiction loves, it loves surprise. Okay, so that's why it's it's a much higher reinforcing element than a consistent or continuous reinforcement schedule. Okay, ever wonder why love bombing is so effective? Some of y'all may be heard of that phrase. So, uh, individuals, if you've ever experienced this, you know that. An individual may text you, call you, or hang out with you every now and again, but you, it's, it totally varies uh, in the amount of time that passes between whenever they give you the affection that you're, you're wanting and looking for. So some people are like, well, how can you become, how do you, 
you know, why do you stick with that if it's not consistent? It's because it's going off of, in my opinion, this is just my opinion off the record, the variable interval schedule of reinforcement. It's because it's exciting. It's similar to like it's gambling where you never truly know when you're going to hit. You never know when that person is going to text you, call you, or show you affection or hang out with you. So when they do, it all comes at once and it's this huge like dopamine rush and enjoyment and excitement. And so that's why it's a lot more reinforcing for some people uh, than just a continuous predictable thing. Okay. Now we're going to finish out talking about observational learning aka modeling. So observational learning is whenever we uh, watch others and then Im imitate their behavior because the behaviors that we're introduced to in our life, we either accept or reject them. And we constantly are learning from watching others and then imitating their uh, behavior. We model ourselves after athletes, after uh, particular, you know, just famous people who we like their style, their, you know, their affect, you know, how they present themselves and how they talk and speak and things like that. So we can, we tend to model ourselves after people that we admire. Okay. And so the model is the person who's imitating the behavior. Now we have, thanks to Albert Bandura, the social learning theory. So uh, with this, he believed that observational learning um, involved more than just imitation and that internal mental states must be uh, involved. So he thought that, um, you know, how you behave can be uh, learned through watching others in the sense of vicarious reinforcement and vicarious punishment. So we always will say the phrase we're vicariously living through somebody and experiencing what they're saying, what they're experiencing through them. But we can learn about what we, and as you all obviously know, we learn by watching other people um, get reinforced or punished. So whenever you see somebody stick their hand on a stove or in a fire, you don't have to directly experience that for yourself to understand, hey, that probably hurts like a thousand suns, so maybe I shouldn't engage in it. But also, if we see somebody getting rewarded for doing something, that's why I think that there's so many uh, like prank channels on YouTube and uh, just people are getting attention for you know, doing criminal activity and just being complete idiots online. It's because people are watching it. People are reinforcing it. They're tuning in. And so if you see people getting rewarded for poor or illegal behavior, then, you know, it's going to make others more likely to want to engage in it because they're receiving um, reinforcement for it, right? They're getting views. They're getting money. You name it. So, What's the punishment in that, you know? And so that's people, a lot of people follow suit on that. Okay, moving forward. So the thing with Bandura that he's most famous for is his Bobo doll experiment. And this was, goes to show with vicarious learning and vicarious punishment is he had uh, adults play with a Bobo doll and they the children were watching them in another room and whenever they watched the adults act aggressively, the adult was either punished, praised, or ignored for their behavior. And so whenever the um, adult was rewarded for aggressively acting toward the Bobo doll, the child was more likely to engage in it. But if the adult was ignored or they were punished for their behavior, then the child was much more likely to not engage in it. So that's effectively a the old school version of what I described in the in the last slide so but that's where we ultimately got the understanding and the official understanding that we do tend to vicariously learn from other people um, be that being reinforced or punished okay so that's where we're going to end today for chapter six I will see you in the next video for chapter seven have a great day